Okay, folks, uh, welcome back. I, th th this must mean you're done with your quiz, I hope, because if, you have, if you're not done with your quiz and you're in class, you're in big trouble because the quiz ends in about an hour. So hopefully you're done with the quiz, it's behind you. We can get back to talking about valuation. Are there any questions before I start? And I don't ask any questions about the quiz for obvious reasons. So there are questions unrelated to the quiz. Any questions before we start? Okay, so let me go back to the Amazon valuation. If you remember, I left you the valuation of Amazon in January 2000. And in January 2000, based on what I thought was a pretty big story for the company in terms of future growth and margins improving, I came up with a value of $35 per share. The couple of things about this valuation that I said, you can apply to any young growth company. The fact is that when you have a young money losing company, your task is very simple. You got to make the small revenues into big revenues and your losses into profits. The task is very simple, but doing it is incredibly uncomfortable, right? Think of why, because you're playing God. You're saying, how do I know I'm right? And what I tried to tell you was you don't, you got to be okay not knowing. In fact, you have to be okay knowing you're going to be wrong and it's okay because everybody else is going to be wrong. It's a mindset change. And for some of you, it's going to be more difficult than others. So I'm not going to act like it's going to come naturally for every one of you, because for some of you, your life has been full of, you do a problem and what do you do? You check the answer. If you get affirmation, you feel good, you move to the next problem. And especially from a quantitative background, we're used to that, right? In geometry, you get to the end, you either prove what you set out to prove or you did not. In algebra, either you solve for the unknown variable or you don't. There's no gray area. But there's a gray area here. And the reason there's a gray area is you, it's not because you haven't collected enough data. Because part of you is going to say, let me go collect more data. If, if only I collected more data, this uncertainty would go away. Trust me, it is not. You collect more data and new uncertainties will open up. In fact, that's the nature of this process because there is real uncertainty out there. You don't know what's going to happen. Nobody does. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to take this valuation and draw on it to come up with some lessons that I've used in almost every young company valuation I've done since I first valued Amazon. As I said, everything I know about valuing young companies, I learned in the process of valuing Amazon. Doesn't mean that I haven't learned more, but this is the foundation on which I built. So here's the first one. Remember when we talked about betas, I told you not to trust regression betas? A long time ago. That applies in spades if you're valuing a young company. For God's sakes, if you're valuing Airbnb, don't look at a regression beta of Airbnb. If you're valuing Palantir, don't look at, even if you're valuing Uber, don't look at a regression beta. You're saying, why not? Because here's what you're going to see. When you look at Amazon's beta in early 2000, that looks like a Bloomberg beta, right? A very early Bloomberg beta page. The raw beta is the regression beta, 2.23. Rodrigo, why should I not trust the beta? What does that regression provide as a number that's a red flag on that raw beta that tells me don't use that beta? What do you see in the output? Probably too high and jumpy. And tell me what in the output tells you it's high and jumpy. The high actually makes sense, right? It's a risky company, 2.2, oh, what's uh, the big deal? The standard error is very high. The standard error is 0. 0.50, right? So think in statistical terms, whatever you just told me, the true beta for Amazon can be anywhere from 1.2 to 3.2. Now, do you see why regression beta becomes almost useless for a young company? So you're saying, what did you use instead? I used a bottom-up beta, but I got creative and I would encourage you to also be creative for your companies. Let me explain what I mean by creative. In 2000, what business was, you know, give it, don't bring in any hindsight. In 2000, looking at Amazon, what kind of company was it? What business was it in? Selling it books retail. online. You know, it was actually beyond the books online, it was selling more stuff online, but it was a retailer. 
But if I'd said Amazon in January 2000, you know, the first word that would come to mind is it's online. Oh, by the way, it's a retailer. Why? Because it was still small. What you thought was the online first and the retail came next. By the time I get to year five and year six, my revenues are 15, 20, 25 billion dollars. If I ask you what kind of company is Amazon, you would say, oh, it's a retail company. Oh, by the way, it sells everything online. The retail comes first because now you have a big tangible business. You think, so what? You know what I used as my bottom up beta for the first five years? The beta is for online retailers because I said, online comes first. It's a young company. It's got big fixed costs. Its revenues have to catch up with the fixed costs. So I'm going to use the beta of online. So that's the 1.6, so the average beta across online retailers. Yeah, by the time I get to your five, 15 billion revenues, it's starting to look more and more like a retail company making money. So guess what I shifted to? In the second half of the high growth period, I shifted to using the beta of all retailers. You think, are you allowed to do this? I have some really good news and really bad news. The really good news is in valuation, you have the freedom to do pretty much anything you want as long as, long as you ju justify it. That's a good news. You're saying, what's the bad news? In valuation, you have the freedom to pretty much do whatever you want. You know why that's bad news, right? Because it means you come to a point, to a fork in the road and say, which one should I take? And I'm gonna say, I don't know, take either one, just stay consistent with, with whichever path you've taken. You're going to come to forks in the road in your valuation like this one and say, what should I do? And one of the forks you're going to come in the road, especially if you're valuing a young company is, hey, what business should I use to get a bottom up beta? I don't think anybody in this class is valuing Palantir. Is anybody valuing Palantir? You, you're familiar with Palantir, right? Have, have you heard of Palantir, the company? Nick, have you heard of Palantir, the company? Raja? Um, yes, I have. So tell me what business you would put Palantir in. It's confusing because they do a lot of artificial intelligence, um, NLP kind of natural language yeah, but processing. Remember, see, what they do is not the business, right? When you think about it, and this is actually good advice to take to, to your company. When you think about what business to put in, the question you're asking is how do they make money, right? Mm. So for using, using that framework, Facebook is not a social media company, it's an online advertising company. Artificial intelligence, I'll be quite honest, is not a business. Mm. Because you can take the AI and create software that you sell a software, you can take the AI and use it on data that you can use to then sell data analytics. It's more of a Palantir. capability in a sense. Yeah, exactly. So Palantir might use artificial intelligence, use big data, and they use all of that to deliver what? Insights, business analysis. Insights. That's exactly right. And who's their biggest customer? Governments, private corporations. In particular, the US government. In fact, they are, they are a company that's been built to be a US government company. Every action they've taken. Notice how quickly they separated them from Silicon Valley. Say, don't bunch us up with those guys, the Facebooks and the Googles who might say, look, I won't do things for the Defense Department. We will do things for you. And I've wrestled with this because at one level, they have some really interesting software and they have artificial intelligence, but ultimately they're a data company that provides proprietary data that their customers can use to do things better. But their proprietary data is directed more towards governments than it is to private companies. You see where I'm going next, right? So when I start my analysis in Palantir, I might use the beta for other data analytics companies, many of which are young and risky and all do variations of artificial intelligence. But as the company gets bigger, you know where I'm gonna push the beta towards? What's the biggest risk? Once they become a big established company, they could look more like McDonnell Douglas or Northrop Grumman, traditional defense companies. And the reason I say that is these companies have very secure income streams but they're very dependent on the US government. So with Palantir, I might start with big data analytic companies for my bottom up beta for the first five years and move towards defense companies in the second half. 
So be creative with bottom-up ideas with young companies. They're still forming in front of you. And don't look at what they do. Look at how they make money. That's always going to be the tiebreaker for you, is how do they make money. Any questions? Now let's get to the, the two big assumptions I made in this valuation. And I'm going to give away the game. Now, I, I tell people, look, you know, I, I'll be, I, I'd rather be transparently wrong than opaquely right. You say, what are you talking about? You know, watching CNBC, somebody comes on and they say something and you're not even sure what they're asking you to do. They've phrased it and framed it in such a way there are ifs and thens and maybes in there that by the time they finish talking, say, did he ask me to buy Tesla or sell Tesla? That's being opaquely right. You know what the advantage of being opaquely right is? No matter what happens, you can say, I told you so. I'm sick and tired of people in business and investing being opaquely right. I'd much rather come out there and say, hey, go sell Tesla and here's why I think you should sell Tesla. And you then telling me two years later, hey, you told me to do the wrong thing, but then I can point to what I did wrong and say, so that's what I mean by transparently wrong. So I'm gonna create some transparency here so you can see when I, if I've made a mistake on Amazon, what that mistake was. What are the two big assumptions I used? A compounded revenue growth of 42% a year for the next 10 years, remember that? where I made the revenues go from a billion to four. You're saying, how the heck did you come up with that number? In fact, if you're valuing a young company, you're struggling with that, right? Why 30% growth? Why not 35? Why not 50? I'll tell you what I started when I, when I first valued Amazon, what I started trying to do and then gave up on. How do you usually value companies? You do 2021 first, and then you do 2022, and then you do 2023. You move sequentially through time, right? That's what we're taught to do. And it seems to make sense. And why would you go to 2029 before you do 2024? I tried that on Amazon when I first started and I was pulling my hair out by the time I got to year three. You know why, right? I'm feeling uncertain about year one already because it's a young company. Then I got even more uncertain in year two and even more uncertain in year three. So my stomach's just all over the place. I'm just saying, look, I don't want to do this. And this is why people give up on valuing young companies is as you move sequentially, they get to a point that I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm either gonna make up stuff from this point on or I'm gonna give up. So after wrestling with this for perhaps a day or two, I said that this isn't working. I've got to do something different. And what I'm going to say next is going to sound mildly mystical, but hang in there anyway. It'll be like Deepak Chopra teaching valuation, but hang in there anyway. I visualize what success would look like at Amazon. Basically, I said, I know the company. I like the company. I like the way Jeff Bezos' the company. I think they will succeed. But if they succeed, what, would a, what will a successful Amazon look like? Let me make a confession, early 2000, I thought a successful Amazon would be a big retail company, much bigger than they were today. And the question was how big? So what, here's what I did. I looked at the biggest retailers in 2000 and every one of them was a brick and mortar retailer. At the top of the list, of course, was Walmart with 200 billion revenues. And then you had, you know, Costco, Gap, et cetera. And I think Gap was number nine or 10 on the list, like at 16 billion in revenues. I looked at that list and said, 10 years from now, when I look at this list, first, will Amazon be on this list? That tells you something about what I think about the company. I said, yes, I think it'll be on this list. Then I asked myself, will it be at the top of the list? Is it going to be like Walmart? In early 2000, my conclusion was that Amazon was not aspiring to be a Walmart, wasn't a discount retailer going for bulk. I said, no, it's not going to be Walmart. And I said, is it going to be like the Gap? And I said, no, it can be bigger than the Gap. Gap is an apparel company. This guy, you know, Amazon sells more stuff. So I basically spent about 30 minutes going up and down the list saying, where would you? you know where I ended up? Between the fifth and the sixth largest retailers in the world. Guess how much revenue the fifth largest retailer had? 42 billion. The sixth had about 40 billion. I split the difference. I say, you know what? I think success for Amazon is going to be about 40 to 41 billion in revenues. I've just made my life 
much simpler. I have my starting point, 1.1 billion, which is where they are now. I think they can get to about 40 billion. All I need to do is then come up with growth rates that get, from, get me from where I am today to where I need to be. So see these growth rates? Saying, where do you come up with them? Transparency requires honesty. So I'll tell you where I came up. I just made them up. No, you didn't miss you. I mean, I made them up. You think you're not supposed to do that? Hey, you know what? If you made a big deal about any of these growth rates, I'll give them to you. So Rodrigo, if you said, look, I think the growth rate in your one is 163.5%. I've done my research. You can have my first year's growth rate. Angela says, oh, I think the second year's growth rate will be 91.55%. You can have your two. If you let me control the starting and the ending numbers in this valuation, in terms of revenues, I control the valuation. So here's the lesson with young companies. What drives the value of the company is not what happens on a quarter to quarter basis, but what's happening to the vision of the company. That's why I find it amazing when a young company has a public offering, it makes its first earnings announcement, it misses or beats its earnings per share by two or three cents and analysts freak out. And my reaction is that's like having a five-year-old who goes off to kindergarten, comes back with a report card. And you take one look at the report card say, you're done, you're going nowhere. Isn't that a little extreme? I'm just because it said conduct unsatisfactory, you're giving up on this kid. That's what we're doing when we're reacting to near term earnings reports. The only rule I followed in making up these growth rates is as I went through time, I made the growth rates low. You know why I had to do that, right? Why is there going to be a force pushing down growth rates as you get bigger? Because you're building off a bigger base. Growing at 150% is easy when you have 1.1 billion. It's going to get much more difficult as you go through. So if you ask me, where did my revenue growth rate come from? It came from my perception of Amazon staying in the retail business, being successful, and having a vision of what that success would look like. Raja? So is it fair to say that no intelligent company would market themselves as having poor growth? No intelligent company would report their financial saying, we're going to do- would, Let me ask you, Raja, let me turn this back on you. Would you ever go into an interview and say, I'm a terrible worker? I work only three no, hours a no. day. No. No. So in a sense, it's, it, it, even if you're a lazy person, you work only three hours a day. At the interview, what do you say? I work, I work like 15 hours. I will do whatever you ask me to do. I'll come in on weekends. You have absolutely no intent of doing any of that stuff. Right. So when you see a company's management get up there, cut them some slack. They're doing, I mean, you're, they, think of this as an interview with the market. They want to put their best face forward. But it's your money and my money that's being invested. We don't take it at face value. They're telling their story. And at every stage you're saying, okay, you know, that part makes sense, but that part doesn't. Or that part doesn't go with this part. So every company that's going out to go out there, at least initially is going to tell not just a big story, a much bigger story. And if you don't restrain them, you know what the story will become huge. Every company has a huge story. Total accessible market of three trillion. Why not just throw a trillion in there? It kind of dazzles people. No. At risk of sounding foolish, what's the point of assigning numerical valuation to a young startup when they have a story and you don't really know if that story is going to be back? Because up? you have to invest real money. Without a new, without a valuation, how do you decide what percentage? of the company you're going to demand in return. This transactions are driven by this, right? So you're a young startup. You come to me for money. It's like Shark Tank, right? I offer you the money, but then I want a percentage of your company. Whether I like it or not, the minute I do that, I'm attaching a value to your company. I can't now hide behind the fact that there's uncertainty. I can't value the company. And this is why I think we need to get over the fact that there's uncertainty because money is being invested based on these valuations, we might as well try our best, even though we know we're gonna, we're gonna be wrong to come up with this. Otherwise it's gonna be driven entirely by what? By what other people think. Unfortunately, a lot of VC is driven by what other people think. So to attach a number to your company, they look at other companies. So oh, they paid $5 per user, I'll pay $5 per user too. It's a terrible way to invest. 
So I agree with you, uncertainty is huge, but you can't make it go away. It's real, it's there. And if you want to invest in the company, you got to come up with a number. Nick? My question is, um, you just said that like missing estimates um, is like reading the report card for a kindergarten. But let's say a company like GME, um, great, GameStop, right? Um, that they just missed estimates and but are they, they're trying- are they young? First, game, first GameStop no, a young company or no? Yeah, that, yeah, that's not what I'm saying. Like they, they, but they're trying to, to change their story, aren't they? So, yeah. so um, would you say that yes. in this case, um, it does matter that they missed estimates? Well, I think anything that causes your ultimate story to change is going to affect value, right? So if you yeah. miss estimates because your inventories were, were running over, you know what I think of it as noise. If you miss estimates because you couldn't get items out in time, I say that. But if you're missing estimates because half the people who are buying your product are returning it, <laughs> then I say, you know what? You told me that you have this great piece of product, but nobody seems to like it. This. So what I'm saying is we need to reframe how we read earnings reports. Right now, we're so focused on the bottom line that we're missing the real story. The real story might be in what's happening to your revenues, where you're getting your revenues, who's buying your product, what, do you, what are your costs looking like? There is information in the earnings report about your big story, but right now we're missing it. We're so focused on that per share count. You know what companies are playing us? Too, because now they know you're so focused on the bottom line that they can have all kinds of bad news in the earnings report about the ultimate story. But somehow with sleight of hand and accounting, they can make it look like they beat their, uh, their expectations. That we had a great quarter, really? You told us you're gonna be global, but nothing is being sold outside the US. So look past that bottom line at the bigger effects because anything that, and with GameStop, the problem is, They've sold us on a real, because without that story, what are they worth? About 30 to $40 per share. So if you're paying 200, you're already paying this huge amount for this transition into this online gaming platform, retail, whatever the story is. You paid it up front. And now they're saying, you know, guys, that, that story we told you, we got a little ahead of ourselves. We're not actually delivering the revenues and the earnings. I'm not willing to write it off yet, but if you have two more quarters like this, you can recognize that the fact that the guy who found a Chewy came over here, I mean, maybe selling pet food online is not the same as selling gaming online, right? That's because you built a business selling pet food doesn't mean you're going to be able to turn around. So I think the, the, that was the first earnings report. The next one, they better start to deliver or you're going to see a real implosion in the value per share. Thank you, Professor, that makes sense. Now let's talk about the margins. So basically, is everybody comfortable on how I'm getting the, the growth rates and I'm starting with the end number and working back rather than doing it sequentially. Now let's move to the margin. My starting margin is minus 36.71%. Awful, right? Let's start with the easy question. If I expect the margin to stay at minus 36.71% a year forever, how much is Amazon worth? Remember the DER proposition? If you expect a company to lose money forever, how much would you pay for it? The answer is absolutely nothing they'd need to pay you. So we got that out of the way. I do think based on what I see in Amazon in January 2000, that they will get much better, that their margins will improve to 10% by year 10. Again, I'm visualizing success, 10% in year 10, and I have a challenge now. In my spreadsheet, I have 10 empty cells. Basically, I have the margin today, I have the margin after year 10, but I don't have any of the numbers for years one through 10. And I'm terrified, terrified of doing this year by year. Can you try to imagine trying to estimate what the margin will look like in year one and year two and year three and year four? I, I know I can't do it. I'd love for the computer to take over and autofill that line. Wouldn't that be great? And that's exactly what I did. I said, you know what, I can't do it. You do it for me. Don't worry, my computer is not some supercomputer, it's just a regular computer. What I had to give it was some guidance, an algorithm. So I'm going to show you my margins by year, and I'm going to ask you what algorithm you think I gave the computer to get these intermediate numbers. And the only clue I will give you is 
Don't think exponential log, any neat mathematical functions. This is very basic math. So everybody clear what, I, what I'm gonna ask you? Margin right now is minus 36.71%. I'm projecting future margins. And somehow I've given the computer the algorithm and here's what it comes back with the answers. Minus 13.35%, minus 1.68, 4.16, 7.08, Looks awfully precise, right? Second decimal point in the margin. If you want to dazzle people, you can say, I have a forecasting model that gave me the margins each year. It's proprietary. Always throw that in there because that way they can ask you how they have to. This is neither proprietary nor is it complicated. Can somebody tell me how I came up with those intermediate margins? Madhur? How do you think I came up with minus 13.35 near one and minus 1.68? Um, let, let me give you a starting point. Where am I now? Minus 36.71. Where do I want to end up at the end of year 10? Oh, 10%. What's Nine. the difference between the two numbers? 10%, basically I end up at 10%. What's the difference between the two numbers? Minus 36.7. 10, the difference is 46.71%. So guess what I did? I moved half the distance to my goal. What does that do? It brings me from minus 36.7 to minus 13.35, half the distance. Now we're in minus 13.35, I want to get to 10. I take half the distance and that brings me to one point, minus 1 1.68. Minus 1 1.68, 10, I move half the distance and of course, the question I'm asking is why half the distance? To which my response is, why not? And I, it sounds facetious, but let me explain why I'm being so sloppy about this. When I build valuation spreadsheets, one of my objectives is to make sure that people who disagree with me on my story can go in and change the inputs that reflect the disagreement. Missing what part of your story is this half capturing? With young companies, one of the things you got to talk about in your story is your pathway to profitability, right? Because you're losing money now, you got to devise a pathway. And that pathway to profitability can be smooth in some companies, it can be rocky in other companies. With Amazon, guess what I'm assuming? Fairly smooth movement, right? Half the distance, that's a pretty big jump then. So much of my improvement happens in the early years and happens very quickly. But let's say you agreed with the rest of my story, but disagreed on this one aspect. You think Amazon is gonna become a big company, it's gonna have 10% margins, but it's gonna to have to struggle a lot longer to improve its profitability than I'm assuming. Do you know what you should do to the half? Make it a quarter. In which case, what happens? Each year, I move a quarter of the distance to my target, which also means that I'm gonna lose more money for a longer period before I turn things around. So if you look at the column and margin then, you will have margins which are more negative for a longer period than I do and a lower value. Let's say you're more optimistic than I am. You think they could move to this 10% margin next year. Magical, but you think you can pull it off. What should you make the adjustment number? Make it one. If you make it one, what's going to happen? I'm going to go minus 36.7 to plus 10 and then 10 from that point on. What I'm looking for are ways in which we can disagree. And then you could say, okay, that's a number. That's what I built into the Amazon spreadsheet. But people were so confused about this half and what to do that I've changed the input in the existing spreadsheet to make it a little simpler. You know what the input in the existing spreadsheet that allows you to control the pathway to profitability is? I ask you for a target margin. Some of you are using my Excel spreadsheet to value the company, right? I ask you for a target margin. You remember the cell right below it, what I ask you? Year of convergence. You're saying, I've got many of you asking, what, what, do, what does that mean? It tells me the year in which you get to your target. And if you're very optimistic and you say three years, I move your margin from where it is today to your target in three years. If you say 10 years, then I move it much more gradually. It's really a lever to adjust how quickly you move towards your target margin. 
So as my margin goes from minus 36 to plus 10, my losses become profits. Ever with me so far? Because margin times revenues. And then I compute the after-tax operating income. And in years one and two, it looks like I'm not paying taxes. Why? The answer is simple, I'm losing money. In year three, I'm making 407 million, but I'm still not paying taxes. How come? Madhuri, since you're still on, what, what, why in year three, even though I'm making money, 407 million, am I not paying taxes? You're carrying forward your operating loss. I'm carrying forward the losses. Do I know how much the losses are? Because I created the expected losses. I, so if you look at this, so I'm carrying the losses forward. In fact, that loss carries into year four. It's not enough to cover my entire income. It's only in year five that I start to pay taxes. And I do this on, on, the, on the Ginzo spreadsheet that if you've used it, I keep track of your losses precisely for this reason. Raja? I think I understand the system of going half from the last number. How do you get from 9.95 to 10? Is that just an arbitrary, we're out of years, let's jump to 10? Terminal mm -hmm. year, I just set it at 10, right? So if you know it's gonna be 10, in, think of your spreadsheet, right? You said 10. To do this process, you need a starting and an ending number. My starting number is the existing margin. Your ending number is an input, 10%. Everything else is the computed number. So I don't even have to move. I know that without the ending number, I can't do any of this stuff. And that's why it's so critical that I need to know what your target margin is. And here again, your story about the company is going to kick in. If it's primarily a SaaS company, or is it a company, if it's a company that's an intermediary, your margins can be 40%. So as your pathway to profitability kicks in, you're going to see huge margins and huge profits. But if your company is a manufacturing company, and I see a 40% margin there, I'm going to say, that's an amazing manufacturing company. What exactly do you make? Unless you're Coke and you're making the syrup, in which case your margins can be immense. With manufacturing companies, margins level out at about 15 or 20%. If you're very successful and if you're a really heavy infrastructure manufacturing company, it's going to be single digits. Not because you're a bad company, but because your costs of producing the product tend to be higher. Any questions on the target margin and moving to the target? Nick, do you have a, is your hand up from before? Or is it uh, have any question? Okay. So we've got the after-tax operating income. And as you're doing all of this, I know some of you are going to say, why are you giving me only 10 years? Right? I mean, my spreadsheet, I end in year 10. And part of you saying, but I'm valuing Palantir. I'm valuing Airbnb. This is a young company. It's going to grow. Why can't I let it grow for 25 years? Mathematically and from a financial theory perspective, no reason. You could go. But you know why I'm stopping after 10 years? Because growing for, I mean, the, the, the right term, scaling up is hard to do. It's much harder. In spreadsheets, you can grow any company as long as you want. But in, re in the real world, growth is really, really difficult to maintain. And one of my favorite graphs to back this up is actually a graph that looked at companies that have just gone public. These are young star growth companies that have gone public. Compare their growth rates to the, gro these are revenue growth rates. Revenue growth rates are growth rate of the sector they're in. So your young software company, you go public, everybody's excited about you. Guess what? Your revenue growth rate is 15% higher in the sector. This is why I bought the company. This study then tracks these companies one year after the IPO, two years, three years, four years, and take a look at what happens to the growth rate at these star companies as you track them through time. 15 becomes seven. So one year after that, they're 7% higher. Two years after that, 3% higher. By the time you get to year four or five, these companies are growing at roughly the same rate of the sector. You know why, right? You're a young star high growth company, you hit the market, everybody notices you. That's nice. But what's the downside of being noticed? Other people say, well, they're growing really fast. And if you're a mature company in the business, maybe we should try that too. Competition kicks in. You're saying this is true for every company. Why doesn't every company crash and burn? The companies that have built in some comparative barriers to entry. And you've got to do it before you enter the market. While you're building your business model, we'll be able to keep growth going for longer. Remember I said 
part of your story then has to be, what does my company, so you can't just say my story is of a high growth company because it's grown in the past. You got to tell me what it is that this company does that allow will allow it to maintain this growth. If you're a young pharmaceutical company, the answer is easy, right? Why will they be able to maintain growth? Because they've come up with this cystic, cystic fibrosis drug that'll deliver growth, what, what keeps the competition out? You got a patent, right? You got complete protection, at least until the next drug comes along. Think about competitive advantages. And now let me fill in the rest of the story. Why did I stop at 10? I've actually, you know, and I did this a few years ago, I took every, you know, every growth company in the US and I tracked how long high growth lasts at companies. So it's a very simplistic study where I just compare the growth rate to the growth rate of the entire market. So basically how many, 10 years is at the 90th percentile of growth periods for growth companies. 90% of companies have growth periods of 10 years or less. So you see why I'm stopping at 10 years? I'm not saying no company grows for longer than 10 years. That'd be an absurd thing to say because the evidence is clearly against me. You can put, what about you know, Microsoft? What about Google? What about, you know, clearly there are companies out there that grow for longer than 10 years, but I'm stopping in year 10 because I don't want to get stuck. And now I'm going to do what I do in every evaluation, which is if you want to grow, what do I have to make sure you do that you reinvest to grow in what, whatever you need to. If you're a manufacturing company, are you building capacity? So if you're Tesla and your, your story is that you can sell 10 million cars, like ARC is projecting, then are you building the capacity to build those cars? If you're a software company and you want to grow that fast, it must mean that you're planning to come up with new software in the future, but that doesn't grow on trees. You've got to invest in R&D. If you're Uber and you're telling me the number of riders will go from 91 billion to 250 million over the next 10 years, I need to know what you're spending acquiring those riders. What's your customer acquisition cost? That's what reinvestment is. It's whatever you need to reinvest in. And as I said with Amazon, I kept it simple. I kept it simple because I don't know what they will need to reinvest in because they might have reinvested in acquisitions, technology, infrastructure, logistics, distribution systems. I don't know what they're going to And Jeff Bezos wouldn't have known either. So to keep things simple, here's what I said. I know what you have. To, I don't know what you'll have to reinvest in, but this much I know you will have to reinvest money. How much? That's where the sales to capital ratio came in. And remember what it measures, it measures the intensity of your business. The higher this number, the less capital intensive businesses. I've used three because that's what online retailers were getting. For every dollar in capital invested, they're getting $3 in revenues. And some of you asked me, could that ratio change over time? What's the answer to that? What did I say in valuation? You could, you know, if you can justify it, you can. So if you can show me that your business will get, so maybe part of your story is that your business will get more capital intensive over time. I'll give you an example. If your argument for Uber is that it'll grow fast, the way it's going to grow fast and improve its margins is by actually buying auto-driven cars and putting, because then you get, the, remember, you get 100% of the fare. So you're giving them higher margins, higher growth. Then you're also telling me, part as part of your story, that this business is going to get more capital intensive, right? Because you're no longer just an intermediary, you're actually buying the car. So you might start with a sales to capital ratio of five for Uber because they're very capital light. But as you go through time and you shift their business model, it'll become more capital light. If anybody's valuing Peloton, this is one of the challenges you're facing, right? And you start the valuation, it does have a pretty large segment of fitness equipment. Fitness equipment business is more capital intensive because you've got to make those treadmills and bikes to sell. If your story is that they'll incre increasingly shift to being a subscription-based company, your sales to capital ratio can actually rise over time to reflect the fact that they become less capital intensive. You control these levers. You know what I'm, I'm kind of trying to preempt, right? 
I've already had a few of you send me evaluation. So what's wrong with your model? Why is it giving me such a low value per share for my company? And my response is, the model is giving you nothing. It's just reflecting what you're assuming. So if you don't like the value, look at your story, look at the inputs that come from the story, because you control that final outcome. So what you have here is the change in revenue every year divided by three is my reinvestment. That reinvestment is everything. You're saying, where's, in fact, I often have people asking, what are you, why are you not adding back depreciation? I am, reinvestment is net capex plus change in working capital plus acquisitions plus R&D, it's all in there. Now, one thing though, that you have to be a little cautious of when you approach valuation, because the way I'm approaching valuation is I'm starting with revenue growth, then margins and sales to capital, and I'm building up to a story, is you want to make sure you're not building up to a story that is a fairy tale. And you could, right? Because if you're not careful and you take these assumptions and keep pushing the levers, you can end up building a company that nobody has ever seen before. A company with a return on capital of 50,000%. So to kind of give you cues on what your own story is delivering as a return, here's what I do. One thing that people often don't seem to realize is when you put a reinvestment into your free cash flow, that reinvestment is also the delta in your invested capital. So if you think about return invested capital, every time you have a reinvestment, your invested capital goes up. So basically what I did here for Amazon is I took their starting invested capital, which is tiny, 487 million. Every time I had a reinvestment, I augmented. So basically I've kept track of my invested capital based on my sales to capital ratio. In the previous page, if you remember, based on my growth and margins, I got after-tax operating income. After-tax operating income divided by invested capital is my return on capital. It's imputed because I never really used the return on capital, but it's coming as output for mine. And here's what I looked at. I looked at my year 10 numbers. Incidentally, this is, this is built into the Ginzo spreadsheet. It's at the bottom, you might not even notice it. If you look, go to the bottom, though, I compute what the return on capital for your company is in year 10. You say, what am I going to do with it? Take a look at Amazon's return on capital in year 10. It's 20.39%. I have to ask myself, am I okay with that return? Is this something that I see a mature Amazon earning? And in early 2000, I was, so here's why. What is the T-bond rate in early 2000? Six and a half percent, right? The average return on capital at retail firms was 18%. 20.39% was within shouting distance. And I said, I can live with that. You know what I wouldn't have been able to live with if this had been 200.39%. What's my spreadsheet screaming at me? It's not even talking to me, it's screaming at me. What is it screaming at me? You're not reinvesting enough, right? And if I'm listening, what should I, what can I change to make my return on capital look better? I can go in and lower my sales to capital ratio. So there's some, you know, there's some back and forth you might go to make sure that you can live with the company you're creating on your spreadsheet. Last class, I talked about the dilution effect. Is there gonna be a lot of dilution at Amazon based on my projections? A huge amount of dilution. Why? Because of huge negative cash flows. Remember this first six years? There's also this huge overhang of options, right? So this is a nightmare company for somebody who worries about dilution. There's going to be a heck of a lot of dilution in the future. And I did a very odd thing. I didn't seem to factor any of the dilution in when I did my value per share because I took the equity value divided by the actual number of shares. You know why I got away with that? because the dilution is already in my value of equity. And here's why. When I did my value of equity, remember those negative cash flows pushed down my value of equity. It had been 21 billion without them, it became 15 billion, I've already factored it. And how did I factor in the options? I took the value of the options, I netted them out. You cannot do that and adjust the number of shares because that'll be double counting. I've adjusted for the dilution indirectly through the cash flows and by valuing the options. So am I worried about dilution? I've already factored in. So worry is going to do nothing for you. It either is in your number, it's not, it's in my numbers. One thing I did mention for Amazon is when you have six years of negative cash flows, I am assuming you're gonna be able to raise capital to keep going. And 
and going and going, right? And that can be dangerous if you're in a market that's shaky and you don't know whether that's going to be true. Just to give you a sense of how much risk there is that your company will not make it because people say, how big can that be? This is actually from, I think the Department of Labor. It's amazing how much amazing data the federal government collects. It usually doesn't use any of it. It just puts it into these big databases that nobody seems to use. But one of the most fascinating databases they maintain looks at uh, startups in different businesses. For instance, they break it down to natural resources, a very old fashioned breakdown. So we look at natural resources. They take every startup in this business, every young company. So they, they're able to do that through tax returns and tax records and other stuff. And then I look at, they look at how many of those companies make it through year one, year two. So hang in there with me. If you have a hundred companies that start in the natural resource business, if you look at them one year later, there are only 82 companies, 18 companies die in year one. In fact, take a look at this drop off. By the time you get to year four, only about 39 to 40% of the companies you started with are still around. And then it starts to level off. The failure rate for really young companies is immense. You're saying, so what? If you do a discounted cash flow evaluation for a true startup, Raja, you're doing a true startup, right? A company that's basically being formed right now, there's really, no. Yes. How old is it? Um, a year, year and a half maybe. So basically you're an infant. And what does this graph tell you? The mortality rate is high. You got to live through your two years. So if I do a D, if you do a DCF of your company and you just look at the DCF, I'll predict you're going to overvalue your company. You know why? Because you're valuing your company and with neat assumptions, you get to terminal value, you get a big terminal value, you do the present value. Say so that's, that's the value of your company if you make it. This graph says, look, there's a 70% chance you won't make it. <coughs> And if you don't make it, what do you do? You liquidate your business. You sell your assets. What assets? I mean, do you own any assets? My guess is there's nothing to sell, in which case your equity is gone, right? right it's right. a huge hole in traditional discounted cash flow valuation. You're saying, why can't I just raise my discount rate? It doesn't work because discount rates are meant to reflect uncertainty about future cash flows, not whether you'll get to next year or the year after. Alex? Yes, Professor, uh, I have a quick question. So about these implicit assumptions about the company being able to keep afloat. In the cost <coughs> of debt, we have incorporated already the default spread. Which back up, back up. How do we compute that default spread? What do we do? We take your promised debt payments. We take the price and then we compute the discount rate on the assumption that you make the promised payments. So even when we do cost of debt, we're essentially assuming that you can make the promised payments. There's a great, so a cost of debt might look like a nice mechanism to bring in default risk, but it doesn't. It brings in the effect of default risk on your cash flows. It doesn't bring in the effect of default risk in terms of ending the game. No, it's I think a very common view. It says, let's just adjust the cost of debt. It should become, you're actually just the day before you go bankrupt. What's your true cost of debt? It's infinite, right? There's no payment you're going to make. So the problem with cost of debt is it's not designed. And that's what I mean about cost of capital not being quite designed to capture the chance you will not make it. It'll capture the additional uncertainty of having to make those promised payments in really bad times. But it's not bringing the possibility that you'll be shut down and put into chapter 11. In fact, here's an updated version of that graph that you saw on the previous page. And you know, if, you, if you're interested, I can send you the links to these. I mean, by itself, it might not help you, but if you're a VC investing in angel, if you're an angel VC, you not know, an angel VCs, but they invest in really, really young companies, idea companies, they know that this is a problem. So what do VCs do to reflect the fact that when they invest in five very young companies, three or four will not make it? Raja, have you talked to any VCs? Kind of in the process with one right now. What is he demanding as a rate of return? Not too sure. He's probably going to demand like six. I'll, I'll, pre I'll prepare you for a shock. Hmm. He's going to say, I want 60% returns. Have you ever seen a discount rate that we've computed in, our, in the class 
You think of what kind of bait you, you would never get to 60 or 70%. Mm. That's because that 60% is not a discount rate. That 60% is your discount rate adjusted for failure risk on the other three. What he's trying to do is say, look, if I ask for 60% and four out of the five companies knock out, I'll end up with 12 to 13%. I'm okay with that. And it's a terrible way, way to deal with failure risk because you're bunching it all into this rate of return. It becomes a bargaining number, right? Right. You ask for 55, you ask for 60. So I think that you know, VCs are aware of this, but the way they deal with it is, in my view, very sloppy by trying to push it into those target rates of return. Because once you do that, it loses its resonance. It's no longer a discount rate. Nick? Um, like um, in my FinTech class, I was taught that like, for example, um, you calculate the, let's say a VC calculates the, the return as the IRR, let's say so for a successful exit and how, given and a what, duration. No, wait, 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 back up. An IRR based on what? Based on, yeah, sure, the, the, the current valuation and the, the prediction of exit. And so how is the exit number computed? Um, it's an EV multiple, right? It's a, it's a pricing. So basically, I it see. takes the value today and the pricing, and it backs out. So, so far, we all agree that's how I'd compute IRR. But once you get the IRR, what do you do with yeah. it? You have to decide whether it's high enough, right? That's where the 60% comes in. I see. Okay, so the IRR is just a computed number. It just is, it, it's non-controversial. You have a starting number, an ending number. It's an IRR not based on a DCF. It's an IRR based on a pricing. I can live with that. And, but then that IRR gets com compared to this target number, number you need to make saying, you know what? And if you're an angel company, you know, your IRR is only 50%. The VC is going to say, I can't invest in uh, IRR is too low. And your reaction is 50% is too low, but you can see his reaction is, right? It's based on a promise pricing and four out of five companies don't make it. He's got to adjust what he needs to make to reflect that failure. So he's punishing you for the fact that, and if you're the one company that has actually a business model that is designed to survive and succeed, guess what? You're bearing the burden of those four losers who also have ideas who've not thought through their ideas. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's not fair, but it's the way it is. So I finished this valuation, remember in early 2000, Amazon said 84 and somebody in the audience asked, is it possible that Amazon's worth $84 per share? What's the answer to that? Possible is such a weak word. Of course it's possible. In fact, I'll tell you what needs to happen. And this is the advantage of having your valuation built simply around a few levers. What are my two biggest levers of value here? It's revenue growth and margins. Everything else is a side story. Notice discount rates, who cares? It's seven, nine, doesn't matter. It's discount, it's revenue growth and margin. So here's what I did, I created a table. With revenue growth on, 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 on one axis, so the, this, it's a vertical, it's the revenue growth and margins on the second axis. Do you remember what my, my base case was? 42%, so I'm around 40, and I said 10% margins. And you can see 42%, so that puts me somewhere there. Right? That's where I'm right now. But could I be wrong? God, could I be wrong? Of course I could be wrong. I tried higher revenue growth rates and different margins, and guess what? With some combination of much higher revenue growth and much higher margins, my value per share can exceed $84. So you're wondering why I've shaded these. These are the numbers that exceed 84. They're the combinations I would need for Amazon to be worth more than 84. So let me restate what they will need. They will need 50% compounded revenue growth and about 14% margins. You're saying 40, 50, what's the big deal? You know what going from 42 to, remember with 42% revenue growth, my revenues in year 10 were 41 billion. You want to guess what a 50% revenue growth would translate into in terms of, it's only 8% more per year, right? You want to guess how much my revenues would have to be? They'd have to be 85 billion. In other words, it's some, this is why you should be careful about messing with the growth rate. So let me just add 30 to 32, what's the big deal? Always take a look at your revenues in year 10 because you'd see how much it means. There's a great book uh, called Expectations Investing. It's written by um, 
two very good friends of mine, Mike Mabushin and Al Rappaport. It's a book that basically takes DCF and turns it on its head. In a DCF, you traditionally take cash flows, you come up with a value, you compare the value to the price. What they do in that book, in this book, is instead of doing that, they take the cash flows, they take the price, and they solve for whatever you're worried about. Oh, you're worried about growth? We'll tell you what the growth has to be. So you can take Tesla, 600 billion market cap, take your cash flows and say, how much would my revenue growth have to be to justify $600 per share? You still have to make the decision at the end, but it reframes your decision instead of looking at value versus price. You look at your judgments on revenue versus what the market is projecting. You know how much Tesla will need as revenues in your tent to justify a $600 value per share. Forget about what ARC is saying. They will need about a trillion and a half in revenues to get there as an automobile company. So if you think they can make only 500 billion, so will make them the largest automobile company in the world by far, you're still one third of the way there. It's a reframing of the decision process. Which brings me to my eighth lesson. One of the reasons I think people end up giving up on young companies is this constant refrain of, how do I know I'm right? How do I know I'm right? How do I know I'm right? And as I said at the start, you know, I'll, I'll save you the trouble. You're going to be wrong 100% of the time. And it's okay. It's okay because you're not God. That's why you're wrong, uncertainty in the future. And it's okay because you don't have to be right to make money. You just have to be less wrong than everybody else. Investing is not about being right. It's about being less wrong than everybody else. And it sounds like a throwaway line, but it's actually something to think about. The reason I like valuing young companies is I think my odds of being less wrong than everybody else are actually greater with an Amazon than with a Coca-Cola. You know why, right? Because people give up. It's something I talked about in the very first class. Your, when you are valuing a company and you feel uncertain and uncomfortable, my suggestion is this is exactly the kind of company where you should be doing valuation. If you find things going easily, there's probably no point doing this valuation. Everybody else probably has that same kind of feeling when they value the company. And just to back it up with this being less wrong, I valued Amazon every year since 1997. I'll give you a little subset of, of the valuations that I've done and how it's affected the way I've invested in Amazon or not invest in Amazon. 2000, remember the valuation? $84 stock price, $35 value per share. What did I say I, was, I did with that? Nothing, because I looked at selling short, but six weeks, I said, I can't do that. I did nothing. One year later, take a look. This is a very momentous year because what happened in 2000, the dot-com boom bust, the economy went into recession. I revalued the company. When you're late, you're saying, how much difference can 12 months make? For a young company, it can be a lifetime of difference. The value that I got was about $20 per share. You say, that's terrible. You got 35 last year, now down to 20. You're right. I've changed my mind about the company. But if you think I've changed my mind going from 35 to 20, Take a look at what happened to the stock price. It went from 84 down to $10 per share. And I couldn't escape. You know what I mean, couldn't escape. Last year I did the song and dance. I can't sell short, time horizon in six weeks. I can't do it. Guess what the question was one year later? I did it to pretty much the same audience as CFA one year later, because now the question was, will any dot-com company ever be worth money again? And I was asked the question, are you buying? And I really had no choice. I looked at the value and I said, you know what? I'm buying. I bought Amazon for the first time in 2001. And here's something, you know, and this is one of the issues I've always had with old time value investing. Well, you know what happened in old time value investing? There's a lot of stuff about when you should buy. But after you buy a stock, what do all these books tell you to do? Let it ride. Hold to forever, which makes no inter sense internally. And here's why. Why did you buy? Because something was undervalued, right? If you bring that same rationale, when should you sell? When something is overvalued. How will you know? You got to revalue a company every, every year to make sure that it still belongs. I have 50 stocks in my portfolio. 
I've got to revalue them at least once a year. Why at least once a year? Because if you do an acquisition of something big, I have to, I have to revalue them more than once a year. And every year, what's the question I'm asking? Does this stock still belong in my portfolio? 2002, it's a good year for Amazon. I revalued Amazon, my value went up. The price went up, but the stock is still undervalued. So it stayed on. 2003 was an incredibly good year for Amazon. My value almost doubled, but the price more than tripled. So guess what I did? I sold in 2004. I was very sorry to sell. I, you know, one of the things is stocks that do well for you on your portfolio, you fall in love with, right? I love that stock. It's made so much money. It becomes your, your best friend. And what am I telling my best friend? Go away. You know, you're not my best friend anymore. You're kind of ugly now. But I tell him, look, you know, it's not forever. Maybe you can be my friend again sometime in the future, which happened in 2007. And they're undervalued again. Remember I said at the start of this process, I said, I've bought Amazon four times. I've sold Amazon four times. And each year that I value Amazon, I have to value Amazon based on what I see there. And since I have all these historical valuations, one of the questions I've always asked is how close or how off were you with your estimates? I'll tell you why I don't spend too much time backward looking, because I know I'm going to be wrong, but I, I, there are two things I do when I, when I look backwards. I look to see whether my mistakes cut in both directions. You know what I mean? If I consistently find myself overestimating or underestimating, there's bias in this process. I have to ask, where does that bias come from? So in 2014, I decided to take a look at my 2000 forecast with the benefit of hindsight. Let's see what I got right and what I got wrong. In fact, let's see what I got wrong and in which direction. First, let, let's look at my revenues. My original forecast for Amazon was that revenues would be about 51 billion in 2014. You know what their actual revenues were? 85 billion. So what have I learned? Amazon's been able to grow much faster than I thought they would. And we'll talk about what they did that allowed them to do it. That's good news, right? I, that, at least for my story, they did much better than expected. But take a look at my margins. My original forecast was they would hit 10% margins in 2010. Take a look at what happened to margins. They initially improved to six. I thought they were on their way to 10%. In fact, mid to, in 2005. And then they seemed to take off in the wrong direction. And the margins kept dropping. So I'm looking at Amazon in 2014 and I valued them. And I said, what's going on with Amazon? Because usually as companies mature, your margin should improve. And somehow Amazon seemed to be moving in that direction and then shifted course. And it led me to reassess my story for Amazon. Remember my original story was for Amazon as a online retail company, a big success. By the time I got to 2014, here's what I was seeing Amazon do. And this is why the margins were decreasing is they kept entering new businesses. And there was no common pattern. It wasn't like they were looking at retail related. Initially it was logistics, they were entering businesses and the only common theme across these businesses seemed to be that these businesses were kind of inefficiently run. The existing status quo wasn't working and Amazon had found a way to do it more efficiently. So in 2014, when I revalued Amazon, I valued them as a disruption platform. I said, this company is not an online retail company. It is a disruption platform. Basically, they can go after any business they want to that they think they can shake up. Now, I'll tell you uh, the results of a survey that tells you how much Amazon has become a disruption platform. This was a survey that asked the CEOs of the 50 largest companies in the world to list out their five biggest potential competitors going forward. So these are you know, banks and retail companies and insurance companies, 50 companies, very different businesses. 47 out of the 50 had Amazon on their list. Let's start with the obvious ones. Do you think Walmart thinks about Amazon all the time? 
I think Amazon lives in Walmart's head, right? It's almost like they've taken over Walmart's head. Everything Walmart does is in reaction. What would Amazon do? Clearly, Walmart, Amazon is... Do you think FedEx and UPS worry about Amazon? Absolutely, right? They saying, why is JP Morgan worried about Amazon? Remember what I said, that the, step, the classic target for Amazon is inefficient businesses with a lot of blubber, fat built in. You walk into a bank and you start an account and you start to see the charges they have and you say, for what, with that ATM that I use, you charge me $2 every time I use it? I'll tell you, when I moved from the East Coast to the West Coast, I kept my bank the same, JP Morgan, JP Morgan, but I wanted to move all of my money from JP Morgan in New Jersey to JP Morgan in La Jolla. Now moving money isn't some guy carrying cash across the country, right? Then I can understand. They charged me $45 for a wiring fee to move money from, this is highway robbery, but I have no choice, right? You know the day I'm waiting for, I'm an Amazon Prime member. I've been a Prime member since 2005. You can take away everything else I own, but don't, don't take away my Prime membership. Basically, I am addicted to Prime. I cannot live without Prime. And I'll wager that's true for most of you. Can you imagine life without Amazon Prime? I mean, how would you guys live? You know what the day I'm waiting for? The day that I get an email from Amazon Prime saying, we're thinking of starting Amazon Bank, would you be interested in moving your money from JP Morgan? To, tell me, take any business. If Amazon offered you an alternative, would you do it? This COVID vaccine, if Amazon were running it, we'd all be vaccinated and completely, by now, right? I mean, they'd be overnight, I'll get the vaccine to you. A guy will show up, a delivery guy, put your hand out of the window, you can cover your face. The guy will poke you and you'll be done. There's a reason why Amazon is the most terrifying company in the face of the earth, if you're a competitor. Now I've told this in many parts of the world. I said, look, you know, whatever business you're in, here's what you should do. Get down on your knees and pray that Amazon doesn't enter your business. Because if Amazon enters your business, here's the one thing I can guarantee. They might never make money, but you will never make money from this day on. You know what happened the day Amazon bought Whole Foods? Target, Walmart, and Kroger lost $50 billion in market cap on that one day. Why Target and, remember the two largest uh, grocery grocers in the country are Target and Walmart. What were people saying? Well, Amazon's in your business, God help you, they're running for the exits. There's actually studies that look at what happens to companies that any business, companies and business that Amazon enters, it happens in company after company. So I'll leave you with my final valuation of Amazon. This was September of last year. And as, you're, as you well know, during COVID, the Fangam stocks, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, Apple, and Microsoft. You know what happened there? Collective market caps. So crisis, everybody else is melting down. Their collective market caps increased by $1.3 trillion. The strong became stronger. So in September of last year, I valued all six of them. So if you go to my blog, you'll see all six of the valuations. And the value that I came up for Amazon was actually 2008-70. And if you think about it, that's a market cap of $1.43 billion. Think of how far I've come from my 2000 valuation, right? Look at my 2000 valuation, I'm struggling to get to 30, 35 billion. Here I'm at you know, one. And people often ask me, don't you feel uncomfortable that your value is changing so much over time with a company like Amazon? How can it not change? The story has changed. The other thing they ask me is, well, how come you didn't predict this happening? Hey, if I, if I could predict this happening, I also predicted the coming of the cloud. I, you know, I, all, other, all that stuff would have made me rich in the first place. 
So when you think story and you think kind of filling in the story, take a look at Amazon because it is, it, t- it shows you how powerful the story is. And, and since we've talked so much about Amazon, let me finish with how Jeff Bezos has always understood the power of the story. There's actually, on, if you go on Google search and look for a letter written by Jeff Bezos, I think it was 1997. He uh, wrote a letter to his shareholders where he described, he didn't describe the explicit business that Amazon was, but he described the Amazon ethos. I called it my field of dreams letter. You guys seen the movie Field of Dreams? Kevin Costner. But do you remember the story? What does Kevin do? He goes. Uh, he, he's a corn farmer. And then he hears a voice that uh, he needs to build a baseball diamond. And if and he does he, so, a bunch of baseball. He legends. does so. And one of his neighbors comes over and asks him the question, what the heck are you doing building a baseball field in the middle of nowhere? And in one of the most famous answers in movie history, what did he say? Uh, if you what build it, he will come. If we build it, they will come. That is the Amazon ethos right there. If we build it, they will come. You know what they do? They build revenues. And they say the profits will come. And they've stayed incredibly consistent with that story all the way through. You know when they started Prime? When did Amazon Prime start? 2004. For six years, it did absolutely nothing. They were stuck at a million members. It was a money loser of monumental proportions. And people kept asking, what the heck are they thinking? Why do they keep this business alive in any other company? Amazon Prime would have been put to sleep. 17 years later, you know what Amazon Prime is? It's, remember, I described Amazon as a disruption machine, right? Amazon Prime is their disruption army that they turned loose in every business. I told you, if I get that email from Amazon saying, would you be interested? I'm off. They've got this army of 125 million people in the US alone that they can turn loose. DNA, it's, patience is built into this company's DNA. It's, and you got to give Jeff Bezos credit for building that, because that's what CEOs do. They don't go out and get revenues. They create a story. They make sure everybody's reading from the same script. Joe? How often uh, throughout the past, because you value it every year, right? So how often was your value for Amazon undervalued um, versus overvalued? I think in six out of the 20 years, it was undervalued. 14, it's been overvalued. And guess what? That's what you should expect to see with the most successful. Because let's suppose, let's assume that every year you do kind of an unbiased valuation of companies. And 20 years later, you look at the winners and the losers. You should find that you underestimate, that basically underestimate the revenues of the winners because the nature of winners is they beat your expectations. If in fact your revenues are on track for the winners, I would hate to see what the rest of your portfolio looks like, right? Because that means you've been pushing up your numbers so much that you have, so I think that in hindsight, you can look at Amazon and say, you should have held it all 20 years. You're absolutely right. The benefit of hindsight, there are lots of different things I could do. But you know, the fact that I was able to find it undervalued six out of the 20 years is, I think, a good thing. Because if I found it undervalued, if I never found a winner undervalued, which often happens and use these dividend discount models, none of these companies ever make it to the top, then I'm in trouble. My valuation model is not designed with enough flexibility to capture these winners. And that paper, I have a paper in value investing where I've argued this is what's gone wrong with old time value investing. Because, you know, and when people talk about growth companies, I said, name me the last growth company or one growth company that Warren Buffett has invested in over his entire lifetime. You know, the answer I usually get is Apple in 2017. Investing in Apple in 2017 is like signing messy at the age of 36 and saying, I you know, signed young, promising Argentine soccer players. At 36, Messi is a legend. Everybody knows he's a legend. He's on the wrong side of being a legend. You bought Apple in 2017, you bought the biggest cash machine in history. It wasn't a growth company. 
I can't think of a single one. In fact, I've thrown this out as a challenge. And the reason he cannot find growth companies is because the valuation approach and model he uses is incapable of ever finding a growth company to be undervalued. That's a bad place to be. So take my model and try to bring in things that are missing because we will find things that are missing. Right now, for instance, one of the things I'm worried about is the fact that I think I'm underestimating the value of platform-based companies. You know what I mean by platform-based companies? Companies like Facebook and Uber that have riders. Why? Because I'm valuing them based on the business they get from that platform, but I'm what I'm, this platform is sticky. I'm missing the optionality or other things they could do with the platform. I want very badly to build that into models, but I don't want to get ahead of myself and do it in a bad way. I want to do it in a way that reflects so one of the things I'm experimenting with, and until I feel the experiments are working, I don't want to add it on as part of it, is how do you bring in the value of a platform? Maybe it's an option. Maybe I have to value it like an option. Maybe it has to be show up as a secondary revenue source that starts late in my valuation. But that's what you're looking for, is systematic mistakes you're making and how do you incorporate changes into your approaches. So just to quickly follow up on that, um, the value of the marketplace or the platform business model, um, is that you said because they're sticky. So would that be like the value of the network effect that the marketplace brings? It's more than that. That I can build into my cash flows, right? Because the network effect, I can give you a bigger market share of advertising. So if Facebook, for instance, I can say, look, these people, once they're on the platform, they're not leaving. So I'll give you higher market share, higher margins. You know what I'm missing though is? You've got two and a half billion people on your platform. What if Facebook figured out a way to deliver gaming? Can you imagine, you know, can GameStop compete with a Facebook? There's, there isn't a chance. What if they found a way to do retail? They're not doing it right now. But if you think about it, typical Facebook users on Facebook an hour a day. Entertainment, I mean, that's the platform values, not what they do with their existing business. What other businesses can you do with the platform? With Uber, for instance, there are 200, you know, right now 120 million people on the Uber platform. Right now, they're just a ride-sharing company. But one of the things they're talking about is putting TVs in the back of Uber cars that they'll actually pay the Uber driver to install. And guess what will run on those TVs while you sit in the back of the car? ads on so basically saying we have a platform maybe there are other ways to make money nine times out of ten these additional things don't work but the one thing that la that catches on could be worth a substantial amount yeah. Roger. thank you yeah a, a lot of the emphasis with amazon is the integration of its various business lines how do you anticipate like regulatory scrutiny antitrust kind of interfering with that in the near future is there that much I mean, Amazon Cloud is not really related to Amazon online retail, right? I mean, in a sense, I mean, when you talk about integration, you're talking about the logistics business integrating with the retail business. Logistics retail, yeah. yeah. And I think that that allows them to have a more seamless retail business. Because if that's all it is, is it allows you to, I mean, I have same day delivery now in San Diego. So I can order at nine o'clock in the morning, by four o'clock it delivered because they have a distribution center within 20 miles and they have those last mile logistics set up. They own, I think, you know, one of the companies, but they've also got this, these other companies that are purely Amazon Prime driven. So the, that part will just make this retail seamless. So by itself, it's not making money. But for logistics to actually make money, they now have to take the logistics business they built and go after the FedEx business, where they're not just delivering Amazon packages, but they're also delivering other, other. so it, it's, it's and, and so the reason I think people, I, I think the regulators are looking at them is not that they're playing unfair, it's just that they play so well that you, really, it's, it's, it's in a sense where, you know, I, I know this isn't the popular view about Amazon, but Amazon is not a company that's broken the rules. It's played by the rules. You might not like those rules, but you wrote them. Early in its life, you can say it didn't pay sales tax because you would have bought online. But those days are like 18 years ago. Every state collects its sales tax when I buy from Amazon. At this point, the advantage they have is they've built 
a system that actually works incredibly well. Right? I mean, you, you take a look at Walmart, look at how many billions they've spent on online retail and horrifically bad their online retail experience is Walmart. I mean, I hate it when I go to Walmart because they have all these third party people now. So when you click on an item, so unlike Amazon where you have Prime as you can, uh, your conduit for deciding what do I want to look at. So it, I think it just gets very difficult to compete against Amazon because they can do things not expecting a payoff next year, two years, or even five years. They're willing to do it ten, with that 10 year horizon. Other companies can talk about doing this, but they don't have the persistence. Yeah, and you brought up their you know, capital life cycle, but at the same time, regulators talk about like diapers.com, predatory pricing. These are the kind of things that come up. And in a sense, when you look at Amazon Entertainment, Prime Video or Prime Music. What is predatory that? pricing? Now, has any consumer ever complained about predatory pricing? It's good for so the consumer. Flesh out. It's good for the consumer, right? The problem is antitrust laws are not going to work on this. Antitrust laws were designed for monopolies who charged you too high a price. Now the regulator is going to, we're going to protect you from lower prices. Do you think this is going to be particularly popular? This is why I think when you talk about regulating Amazon, you're going to very quickly start to see pushback. And you know what Amazon's going to use to drive that pushback? 125 million prime members. That's enough to get anybody elected president, right? You piss off Amazon prime members, there's zero chance of you winning an election. So what if the day after the regulators come after Amazon, every Prime member got an email saying, you know what, we might have to increase your Prime membership fee from 129 to 399. And if you have complaints, please write the Justice Department and tell them, you know, you don't like this. It's the way Uber stopped regulation in New York City. So regulation is coming to Amazon, but to people who think it's going to be easy, they, they, they don't even, they, they, they really need to look at Amazon too. Nothing is easy with this company. Last question, Trion. Um, So out of these like Amazon effects, I'll call them where like, for example, like it's almost like a Medusa effect, right? Where they like look at any industry and suddenly it just turns to stone. Um, you know what, and why you should be very scared if they take a look at the education industry, you think the education industry, what do you guys think about this, these, your experience there? Is this a very efficiently run entity NYU, you think? It's the exact opposite of efficient, right? Is it customer focused? Do you feel like you're you know, the center of attention? You're last on the totem pole, right? Everybody else think, do you think if Amazon offered Amazon University, you might be interested? You know what? That's, that's exactly what, I'm, what we're thinking about. There's businesses that are entrenched that people think cannot be broken into. Amazon can. So that <laughs> type of insulation, as well as um, like their government insulation, where, where are those like priced into? Uh, your, your valuation model, like what? Well, that's what's what, the, I mean, take a look at the revenues I'm giving Amazon, 1.3 trillion. No company in history has ever earned more than 600 billion in revenues. Look at what happens at margins, 12% margins. No retailer in history is, you know, earns more than seven or 8%, especially if you're broad based. It's in there. Okay, folks, I've got Thank to you. sign off. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.